Peter Kremlin, live on Sky News Australia. Good evening and welcome to the show. I'm Caroline Marcus filling in for Peter Credlin. Let's take a look at tonight's top stories. Here's what's coming up on the program. More trouble for Anthony Albanese as his party hits a slump in the polls, especially among women. I'll break that down with my all-star panel shortly. Also tonight, the latest out of Israel as discussion about Egypt's bold proposal continues. I'll be speaking with an IDF reservist shortly. Plus, pro-Palestinian activists gate crash Boxing Day sales. Is this the new normal? But first, we've heard a lot in recent times about universities and the way they are increasingly becoming hostile to the concept of free speech. Now, Sky News can reveal one professor is taking RMIT University in Melbourne to the Fair Work Commission over claims of bullying and unlawful dismissal. Professor Andrew Timming was a professor of human resource management and at one stage a deputy dean at RMIT, one of Australia's top and oldest universities. He enjoyed a fairly good relationship with his colleagues, that is, until he says a Twitter spat involving no less than two of the most controversial figures in modern culture, internet personality Andrew Tate and climate activist Greta Thunberg erupted. Let's rewind to this time last year. Tate is a British-American influencer and self-described misogynist currently awaiting trial in Romania over rape and human trafficking charges. But in the week before his arrest on those charges in December 2022, Tate posted this tweet, taunting Thunberg with a picture of himself in front of his Bugatti and boasting about his 33 cars asking for her email address so he could send a complete list of their respective enormous emissions. Thunberg dutifully responded, yes, please do enlighten me. Email me at smalldickenergy at getalife.com. Touché. Thunberg was almost universally applauded on the platform over that repost. Or as the young people like to say, sick burn. Enter Professor Timming who had the temerity to challenge the adoration that Thunberg was attracting. He posted demeaning sexual jokes when directed from a woman to a man, smiley face, wink face. Demeaning sexual jokes when directed from a man to a woman, bomb emoji, skull and crossbones emoji. Fairly innocuous. Uh, observation, you could argue, on what could be seen as different hypocritical standards when it comes to the way men and women are treated, especially in the workplace. Of course, Twitter, now X, did not see it that way, and Professor Timming found himself at the centre of a Twitter storm. He claims the university threatened him with disciplinary action, and under pressure, he deleted his Twitter account. It wasn't only the tweet, though. Professor Timming has also been published in the conservative Spectator magazine, and he claims he's one of the few out-of-the-closet conservative academics. His ideologies did not go down well in a field academia entirely captured by woke orthodoxy. Eventually, after suffering what he alleges was vicious bullying, Professor Timming launched a grievance in May this year. The following month, the university placed him on extended leave and initiated his termination on the grounds of ill health. Now, that's despite his doctor and an independent medical expert appointed by the university deeming him fit to return to work immediately. Professor Timming made an anti-bullying claim in the Fair Work Commission but dropped the action when the university opted to reinstate him. But at this point, he'd already been demoted as deputy dean and was returning as just a professor. He claims the university then overloaded him with an unfair, unfair amount of work in an effort to effectively push him out. The university claims, according to documents seen by Sky News, that Professor Timming refused to do the work allocated, which amounted to serious misconduct. He was sacked last week 
days before Christmas. Professor Deming has now lodged another application with the Fair Work Commission about his dismissal, seeking reinstatement, compensation and damages, and is petitioning the university's vice-chancellor to reinstate him. An RMIT spokeswoman said the university would not be able to respond to our request for comment on the claims made by Professor Timming because it does not comment on individual staff matters regardless of employment sta status. Now, some of the circumstances in Professor Timming's case are disputed, but the allegations are troubling. We've seen a disturbing trend in universities here and around the world where free speech is simply not appreciated. You'd think that universities should be grounds for free uh, intellectual speech, even challenging speech, but that doesn't seem to be the case. And the irony is that some of the universities, some top universities, both in the US and here in Australia, seem to only be fiercely protective of free speech when that free speech involves anti-Semitism. Also, as Australia records a staggering increase in anti-Semitic incidents, a shocking incident has been caught on camera this morning, filmed early this morning in Melbourne, in the suburb of Pran. Take a look. What are you guys doing? Outside. Just having, cleaning up the community from bull****. <laughs> So there is the man saying, just cleaning up the community from bull. I can't say the rest of that word. That's what one of the men told the woman who asked why they were tearing down posters of Jewish hostages. There can be no doubt whatsoever now that Hamas kidnapped 240 hostages, most of them Jews. More than half, Israel says, remain in captivity. So this cannot honestly be about any genuine denial that hostages weren't taken. What it says is that some in the community can't even bring themselves to see the humanity in Jews, even Jewish babies. And now for the latest out of the Middle East. Israeli forces have expanded their ground offensive into refugee camps in central Gaza. The announcement of the new battle zone threatens even more destruction in a war Israel says will take many months as it vows to quash Hamas. It comes as Israel is considering an ambitious proposal by Egypt to end the war, which would entail the release of hostages, a ceasefire, and the creation of a Palestinian government of experts to run Gaza and the West Bank. Joining me now from the south of Israel is Nimrod Vroman, a reservist in one of the IDF's artillery corps' special units and a peace activist. Nimrod, thank you. I'll start by asking you what the latest is on this war and the ground offensive that we're hearing about into the refugee camps. Hi, thank you, Caroline. Thanks for having me over. Um, yeah, well, I'm about to head to the base right now, and I, I'm very fortunate to get my updates from the base. So they're, they're sort of like the most up-to-date you can have. Um, I think that this war has several phases, and the Israeli government has said that many times. And we are now, well, pe people have been calling it different phases. I still see it as the first phase, which is a phase in which the IDF is in a process of asserting, asserting control over areas from which the Hamas is launching attacks on Israel. Now, the first areas that the IDF asserted control over were strategic spots in the north of Gaza after you know we could move the population or ask the population to move to the south. Um, then we started asserting control in Yunus. And those areas are also where the Hamas launched the attacks of October 7th on us, and also where they launched rockets on us. And we still have rocket fire uh, to the center of Israel, not daily. It's reduced significantly because the IDF's mission is uh, successful so far, as difficult as it is to say, because this is a very difficult war for us. Uh, and the central Gazan refugee camps are one of the last few areas in which we need to assert control. Now, the way that the IDF is doing it is um, sort of like an area by area approach. 
and therefore it seems like it's always expanding. But at the end of the day, the Gaza Strip is a finite uh, piece of land, and I predict that once uh, this part of the process will be over, then uh, the next phase will begin, which will be a far more surgical phase, and it will uh, optically let, uh, be less destructive, but I do hope it will continue to be destructive for Hamas uh, specifically. Okay, well, we've been reporting, as you might have heard, that uh, this proposal from Egypt to bring an end to the war has been put on the table. What is your personal view on this? Do you think that Israel or Hamas, for that matter, could seriously accept this proposal from what you know of it? Well, this, this, it's a great question. Um, and I can give my personal opinion about it. I'm 41. I grew up in Israel alongside Hamas anyway, in many ways and uh, built my family here alongside them. I was a teenager when they uh, exploded here in buses in the uh, 90s and the early 2000s. Um, and, and, I, and as you said before, I was a bit of a peace activist and still hope to come back to being one after this war. Having said that, in Israel, um, Israel is no longer, Israelis are at the moment definitely no longer capable of differentiating between the Hamas political arm, which has sometimes existed independently of its military arm, and the Hamas's military arm. Since Yechid Sinwar took over in uh, the Gaza Strip, they have uh, been completely one and the same. In reality, they have been one and the same because the political arm also and the social arm also uh, managed their education system and radicalized them so heavily against Israel. And they do share the same charter. So at this point, after the trauma of October 7th, it's difficult for me to see how any constituency in Israel, voting constituency in Israel, uh, supports a solution whereby Hamas still exists. Uh, Having said that, uh, compromises are uh, things that, you know, situate endpoints that neither side is happy with. And you might hear the name Hamas, uh, but it may refer to remnants of their social and political arm that have no ability to weaponize, radicalize, and organize them against Israel. And that will be, you know, sort of like the lowest branch possible maybe for them to climb off this tree and end this war, which is very bad for uh, for the Gaza Strip and for Hamas in particular. Yeah, I guess, I guess that would be a way of them saving face almost, that they still get to be part of this. It, it's very interesting. I want, I want to take you, though, to footage that we've seen come out in the last day or so, a footage of... Uh, Gazan men being led uh, shirtless. It appears into a stadium by what is purported to be the IDF. Now, I don't think the IDF has verified or denied it at this stage. Can you explain what might be happening here and whether this video is authentic? Uh, you're not seeing what's on our screen, of course, but you probably have heard of, of the latest footage. Um. Uh, well, interestingly, I, I am actually seeing what's on your screen. Um, I've seen this video, and uh, I don't know if it's authentic footage. I can't uh, confirm nor deny that. But, you know, for the purpose of this conversation, uh, let's let's assume that it is, and let's assume that it is the IDF. I, I just don't know. Um, but I can tell you from my experience, being in reserves for 80 days, uh, the, when, when we say that Hamas is embedding itself in civilian population, I don't necessarily think that uh, the viewer perhaps understands exactly what this means. There are hundreds, sometimes thousands of Hamas operatives in the different areas that we are trying to assert control over and eradicate Hamas from, which is a, a legitimate purpose for this war after the October 7th attacks and Hamas's motivation to conduct them over and over again, as publicly stated by them. We need to enter these areas from which we try to uh, move the population. And we didn't succeed to move 100% of the population in these areas. There's, there could be thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of people left in a city where there might have been a few hundred thousand. And when we say Hamas embeds itself in the population, we mean that it's operatives that are not underground. And there are many that do not use necessarily the underground systems and are there to attack us. What they do is they ensure that the population within the town uh, sets itself up in, uh, in closed areas. Um, they'll also like they might repurpose a school, and then on the news you'll see that Israel attacked a school. It's it's now harboring the the, the civilians of the town 
except that all of the Hamas operatives are among them. Yeah, it, so they it, enter these areas. Very easy yeah. to uh, and, to try and com complicate it for Hamas and, because they they operate this way. Uh, Nimrod, there's so much more I wanted to speak to you about, including your attempts to bring AFL to to uh, the Israelis and Palestinians, and we're going to have to save that for another conversation. I really appreciate your time, Nimrod Broman, joining us from Israel there. I'm going to move on now to our panel tonight. Uh, we've got two lovely ladies in the studio with me, Tina McQueen and uh, Prue McSween. Thank you both for joining me. Uh, I wanted to bring you uh, some of the latest news that we've heard today. Um, this week, uh, we've heard that the Albanese government has uh, slumped in the polls and, uh, in particular, it's lost ground in a key demographic, which has been considered the swing group that decides elections. It, Tina, in, in male voters, Labor leads the opposition by a slim 1%. Why would this be? Well, I think a lot of, uh, in every demographic, there's a bit of uh, voting remorse where um, everyone in every electorate now realising that Albanese sold them a pup. They're struggling, they're finding life very difficult and most interesting I found with the female demographic, I've been telling Liberal parties have this silly idea that if you put up female candidates, females will vote. That is absolute garbage and finally they're realising that that's the truth. What you need is good policies, policies that will help people that are really struggling at the moment, not the, the lies that Albanese is spreading around and also the fact he's hardly been in the country. Everything's gone wrong for Albanese and I genuinely believe the worst is yet to come for him, Carolyn. Well, you know, having an all-star women panel might be a good thing in television, not necessarily in politics, though, for political parties. <laughs> no, you want good candidates with decent policies. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. right. Um, look, Prue, an exclusive survey in the Sydney Morning Herald this morning shows that a major contributing factor to these shifts is the government's failure to provide cost-of-living relief I know we sound like a broken record and Peter does bang on about this for very good reason all the time, but when will they learn? Well, they're just so out of touch. You know, women, they wonder why they're losing women. Women are the ones who are in charge of the household budget in most cases. They're the ones trying to struggle to keep the family going and pay the bills. It's fine. They bought the lie that was Albanese, you know, the, the council flat. No, I know he grew up in it, but I'm just saying this image, this persona that was, you know, the new glasses, the new teeth, the new outfit, the cute dog and the girlfriend and the poor me story. And, of course, women fell for it. A lot of women did and a lot of other voters did. Now they're seeing that that ain't enough. The guy is all talk, no action. He spent almost 500 million bucks of our money on, you know, this ridiculous voice that's Which not going to help says, anyone. He says he's and, not at, at oh, fault of, of no him, responsibility. Him, not me. But, you know, this is the problem, that he hasn't come up with any policies that women in particular understand are going to improve their lives. And this is his problem. He's a fake. And all the governments around, all the Labor governments around the country are fakes. Well, more on the government and the Albanese government has sparked a fresh war with business under their latest proposal being examined by the Senate. Employees who sue companies over sexual har harassment or discrimination claims won't have to pay their bosses legal fees if their case is unsuccessful. The employer would instead. Tina, you would assume this bill is... is in hopes that victims of harassment won't be financially deterred from making complaints. But these are real concerns. The Director of Workplace Relations has said it's far too broad, it's unfair to small business, and it lacks appropriate exemptions. What do you make of this? Oh, I think it's going to be a nightmare. And I think it's just going to create so many more cases. It's basically encouraging people to come forward. And some of these accusations are flimsy, without basis. And we've all seen many histories of that with, with many different people. Um, so I think it's a tragedy. Business can't afford this. They're bad enough with the IRR reforms and other aspects that are really hurting business at the moment. This is just another knife in the guts for business, Carolyn. It, it seems like the latest incarnation of that the Me Too movement, and we've seen yeah. how much destruction that can wreak. So, but people are also waking up to that now, Carolyn. You know, they've seen all that and how how different things have played out, and they're not so uh, happy to jump on that Me Too train anymore. Yeah, well, what's your take on this, Prue? Do oh, you well, think it's another impost on businesses. Tina said, small and, and large business. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, it's also helping their union mates and their cronies, you know, the, the legal firms who are going to make a fortune out of this because it's going to be a win-win for them. So it's really sad that, you know, small business is going to get to the stage as a small business owner. I think, God, where are the robots? I just want to employ <laughs> robots or scale down your business because it's going to flow on. We're worried about the cost of living. It's all going to be passed on to the consumer. And this is where, you know, this is the hypocrisy of Labor who say they're trying to address small biz uh, the, the cost of living. They're not. They're IR laws. Uh, the lack of productivity incentives and now this attack on small business its all and big business, it's all going to add to cost of living. I mean, uh, running a trial, let alone settling a lawsuit, can cost millions and millions. Exactly. I'm not quite sure uh, how businesses will be able to afford an influx of these mm. kinds of suits. Let's move on to another topic and Chadston Shopping Centre in Melbourne, the nation's biggest shopping mall, was targeted by pro-Palestinian activists yesterday who staged a leaflet drop on the busiest day of the year. Tina, one of the letters that they dropped read, while you're shopping, bombs are dropping. Just like the Carol's by candlelight protest on Christmas Eve, there are kids around here and the people are doing their post-Christmas shopping not sure that this is the right place. It's absolutely disgraceful. It's not in Melbourne, though. Every Saturday, I live in the city, um, and in the Pitt Street Mall, there are Palestinian protests. Now, I constantly go up to the police and say, do they have, you know, do they have a... a, a um, yeah, yeah. ..to do this? But it's just disgraceful, and particularly right on, on Christmas time, where we want to have sort of a joyous, everyone come together, New Year. It's awful. But I'm happy to say they're getting very little response in the Pitt Street Mall. People are just walking past and rolling their eyes and absolutely disgusted by it. Of course, I've said my bit, that which I probably uh, shouldn't do in some cases because <laughs> I'm going to get it back. I, but I, I it, can't possibly <laughs> imagine that being the case. But it's, <laughs> so, it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating. And I'm just sick of the Palestinian flags everywhere, up and down, up and down Pitt Street and Hyde Park. It has to come to a stop. You know, I think, Prue, that people have the right to protest. And I've I'm, but I made the point yesterday. I think that the, these sorts of actions actually turn people off yeah. from a cause. Totally. Yeah. You know, we're over it. We don't want this imported. You know, this is a bunch of losers, opportunists, who are appropriating an inter, uh, international uh, conflict. And we don't want it here. We have sympathy for the fact that children and women and innocent civilians are dying. Have your argument with Hamas. It's because Hamas is the one that is, is appropriating the aid for a start. So, of course, you know, the, they're saying there's no water. It's because they're taking the fuel that, you know, operates the desalination plants and appropriating all the money. Uh, they're, they're setting up their military zones in these civilian areas. So don't blame the Israelis. Blame Hamas. But, of course, it's selective, isn't it? They don't care. But they we just... need to remind everyone how this started, October 7. We constantly need to remind people of that exactly. and we must never, ever forget. Too right. And, you know, just on your point, Prue, the, they never seem to call out Hamas at these no, protests. Never. But now they're actually appropriating the IDF because they're dropping leaflets on people, yeah. which the IDF, as we know, does among their yeah. civilians to warn them to get they're out of there. using all the so... tactics of Hamas here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, just finally, let's talk about bosses at Australia's major public service departments because they've been dished major pay rises going into 20. 2024. Prue, uh, amongst a myriad of other hikes, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet Secretary Glyn Davises will now take home a whopping $977,000. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars more than even the Prime Minister himself. Well, it might surprise you to say, for me to say that I don't mind them getting paid well if they were good. <laughs> the problem is we know they ain't good. And they hire consultants. They don't do this work Exactly. Themselves. They never do anything. They Which don't costs know. even more, of course. You know, so, the, you know, we ne they need to compete with the, you know, the, the businesses outside to get yeah. the best people. But they've got either apologists for the government, they're political activists, a lot of them, it's been infiltrated by all these lefties, and they are pathetic. They wouldn't get a job in the real world. So, in, from that basis, I don't support it, but it's just sad that we haven't got good public servants. They ain't the servants of the public, they're the servants of the politi politicians. 
Tina, I chose the wrong industry, didn't I? I should have gone into public service. <laughs> I Clearly, can that's see you the as head of a department, Carolyn. <laughs> Let's see what we can do when we're back in government. <laughs> Albanese, over to you. <laughs> Tina McQueen, Prue McQueen, thank you both so much Thanks, for your time Sarah. tonight. Now, after the break, we will return to our exclusive story and speak to the very professor who claims he was sacked over a tweet. Welcome back. I want to return to our exclusive story now where a former RMIT professor is taking on the university after he was stood down days before Christmas. He believes he is being treated unfairly over his conservative views. Professor Andrew Timming joins me now. Professor, how are you feeling after your sacking? It's been difficult. It's been a difficult week for me. But having said that, I knew that it was coming. I knew uh, almost immediately after I lodged my grievance that the university had decided that I needed to go. Uh, and it tried for six months to get me out. Um, I didn't leave voluntarily, so I knew it was gonna happen. And it does help when you anticipate something is gonna happen. Well, let's go back now to the tweet that you say pushed the university over the edge. You noted how demeaning sexual jokes from a woman to a man were treated differently than those from a man to a woman. Now, that attracted a pile-on from Greta Thunberg's supporters. This was, of course, over the whole Andrew Tate, Greta Thunberg Twitter spat. How did the university handle that Twitter storm? Well, I mean... First thing I would say is that I have published in peer-reviewed journals on the Me Too movement before, so I have every right to comment publicly on this particular matter. Um, I understand that uh, some individuals may have been offended by the tweet. Um, I understand that there were a number of complaints that were made to the university, but that's neither here nor there. The fact of the matter is, academics have a right to be offensive and shocking. Um, it's embedded into the free speech codes of universities. And in my view, that tweet was neither offensive nor shocking. It was simply an observation of a sort of double standard when it comes to sexual harassment uh, across the two genders. I think a lot of people at home might be wondering what all the fuss was about for such a, a seemingly innocuous tweet. But what was your treatment like at the university after all of that happened? Well, immediately after the tweet, uh, I was brought into a meeting uh, and I was told, threatened uh, uh, over the tweet itself. Um, and, uh, you know, as a result of the pressure, I ended up deleting uh, my Twitter account. Uh, and I'd hoped that that was going to be enough to uh, assuage or to pacify the concerns of the university. But uh, after that point, um, I was essentially a targeted individual at RMIT. And um, I suffered a number of um, incidents that ultimately resulted in me lodging the grievance uh, against the university, alleging violation of the university's free speech codes. It wasn't just the tweet, though. You did have um, articles published, for example, in The Spectator magazine. Is it fair to say that you believe that you were essentially being discriminated against or punished by the university for being openly conservative? It's not easy being a conservative in academia. Uh, the reason it's not easy being a conservative in academia is that uh, most of my colleagues and most of university uh, administrators tend to be of the political left. Um, and it is difficult to be in an environment like that when your values don't align to theirs. When someone from the right, like myself, uh, looks at individuals on the left, um, I might think, hmm, these people are naive or they don't quite understand the way the world works. But when people on the left view right-wing people like myself, they don't look at me as naive. They look at me as evil. And when you look at an individual as evil, it's very easy to uh, dehumanize and, and mistreat. And I think that's essentially what happened. Well, the university's position was that you were fired because you refused to do work that had been allocated to you, amounting to serious misconduct. What do you have to say to that? I mean, look, just to give... I'm not going to get into the nitty-gritty because um, there is a, a, um, an appeal... Uh, underway at the moment, and I think all the details will eventually come out. 
Um, but what I can say is that a week after lodging my grievance, um, I was stood down. Uh, when I asked why I was stood down, um, the reason I was given was that the university had initiated the termination of employment on grounds of ill health clause in our bargaining agreement. This is a curious thing because the day before the university received a note from my doctor stating that Professor Timming is fit to carry out his normal duties now and into the future. And on the very day uh, I was stood down, I gave a normal presentation uh, to my colleagues and they saw that I was fine. Uh, I was stood down for um, a few months. Uh, during that time, um, I was viciously bullied. Uh, I was sacked as Deputy Dean of Research and Innovation. Um, the university's own doctor, who I was referred to through an IME, told the university that I should be returned to work with immediate effect. Um, instead of returning me to work with immediate effect, they just continued with the stand down and wouldn't let me back in. Uh, finally, I ended up taking them to the Fair Work Commission and the anti-bullying jurisdiction. Uh, rather than face a loss in that jurisdiction, the university did finally relent and, and let me back into work in October of this year. Um, and at that stage, they uh, tried to throw a bunch of additional workload onto me that hadn't been agreed uh, earlier in the year during our workload discussions. Uh, and um, having tried to impose all this additional teaching workload on me, I initiated through our enterprise agreement a dispute resolution procedure uh, that enables individual academics to dispute their workload. Uh, and um, this matter was pushed to the Fair Work Commission. Um, I followed all the legitimate channels to dispute that workload, but rather than listen to what the Fair Work Commission had to say in the matter, the university just decided that um, I was being terminated for not doing the very work that I was legitimately disputing through the enterprise agreement. So it's obviously unlawful, uh, and I have uh, every intention of holding the university to account. I will not go gentle into that good night, as Dylan Thomas said. Well, we'll go a little bit more into what you're planning with that appeal and the other action that you've taken in a moment. But I just want to get your view. I mean, we've seen so many cases recently, starting perhaps with Jordan Peterson over in Canada, uh, closer to home, Holly Lawford Smith, Peter Ridd, cases where academics have spoken out publicly about how they feel their free speech has been. Uh, infringed upon. What do you view as happening here in Australia and overseas when it comes to free speech on campuses? It's simple. Uh, free speech is under attack. Um, but I should probably clarify that statement to say that uh, it's only particularly aspects of speech that are under attack. Um, I find that as long as you are towing the the woke narrative, so to speak, or pushing the woke message, you can say whatever you want to say with essentially no repercussions. Um, but if you take an alternative view, uh, such as I do, uh, a view that uh, accentuates the, um, the benefits of conservatism and the benefits of free markets and free enterprise, uh, these views are very much viewed uh, with disdain. Uh, and as a result, uh, so many academics are uh, afraid to speak up, and quite rightly so. Why wouldn't you be afraid to speak up? I mean, look at what happened to me. Look what happened to Holly Lawford Smith. Look what happened to Jordan Peterson. There's any number of academics. Um, and that's why uh, this year um, I've been a, a founding member of the Free Speech Union of Australia, um, who happens to be uh, representing me in, in my current case, in my current appeal. Um, and it's absolutely essential that we have a mechanism for enforcing the, the rules that we all agreed on, the rule of law. It is the rule of law that uh, enables society to function properly, uh, and no one is above the rule of law. Uh, when I say the rule of law, I'm talking, broadly speaking, not just about obeying the law, but about obeying employment contracts and policies and procedures. No one and no institution is above the law. And we absolutely need a, an organization like the Free Speech Union to hold organizations to other organizations to account uh, when they um, infringe on people's rights to free speech. 
Well, okay, um, uh, Professor Finley, I just want to ask you where that appeal is up to. You've got uh, an appeal currently, an application before the Fair Work Commission, rather, I should say, a complaint with IBAC, as well as a petition that you just mentioned on this Free Speech Union of Australia website. Uh, asking the vice chancellor, or demanding rather that the vice chancellor of RMIT reinstate you. How do you rate your chances in all this? Uh, look, um, what the university has done over the last six months has all been done in the shadows. Uh, that's not the case anymore. Um, people know now what's going on. I think that that will create uh, a sense of urgency on the part of the university to ensure procedural fairness in this appeal. Uh, I was terminated um, last week, a couple days before Christmas, right? Great, great Christmas present. Uh, as a result of the uh, enterprise agreement, I have a right to appeal that decision. Um, so technically, um, I've been terminated, but there is this process that uh, the university now has to go through. And um, I feel that uh, my chances at the appeal stage are actually pretty good. Um, I know the vice chancellor of RMIT personally. I've spoken with him about free speech issues, uh, and I believe he genuinely wants to do the right thing. You know, we'll, we'll find out, but I, I think he wants to do the right thing. Professor Timming, good luck with it all. Thank you for your time and for sharing your story with us. Thank you. Now, as I mentioned at the top of the show, an RMIT spokeswoman said the university would not be able to respond to our request for comment on the claims made by Professor Timming because it does not comment on individual staff matters regardless of employment status. It is interesting to note that in 2019, the federal government commissioned an independent review of Australian universities and free speech and academic freedom that resulted in a new model code that was proposed. RMIT was one of the universities to adopt that code. It remains to be seen whether the university was just paying lip service to the idea of free speech or if it is genuine about the principle. After the break, a cybersecurity expert warns we are facing cyber attacks once every six minutes. Plus, Lisa Wilkinson wants to be back on our screens, but some aren't so sure. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Well, cybersecurity breaches have really been the theme of 2023, haven't they? Australia's leading cybersecurity boss, Hamish Hansford, has revealed that our nation faces a cyber attack once every six minutes. Six minutes. Shadow Cybersecurity Minister James Patterson said Home Affairs Minister Claire O'Neill needed to reassure Australians that the government was fully engaged in dealing with these attacks. He also said the Australian government can't make the same mistakes they made with their slow and incompetent response to the High Court's ruling on immigration detention. Well, joining me now to discuss this is media writer for The Australian, Sophie Ellsworth. Sophie, welcome to the show. Sophie, a cyber attack every six minutes. This is very alarming. Oh, Carolina, absolutely is. I was just reading this afternoon on the Australian website that Edgar's, the massive car dealership, which has over 300 dealerships nationwide, has had a cyber attack. Uh, today and they're warning customers to be careful. This is commonplace now uh, and we saw last week with St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne had a cyber attack and still don't know what information, if any, was stolen. So I think Australians are on high alert after the Medibank and the Optus cyber attacks. But unfortunately, Caroline, as you and I both know, we do so many of our tra transactions electronically now. It's very difficult to avoid this uh, and, and, you know, make sure that we can not be victims to cyber attacks because all of our information is electronic. So uh, that's why I prefer cash, but sometimes it's just not feasible. So this is a real worry, and I think we will see more of this, particularly as Australians battle the cost of living. Uh, hackers are going to be out there in force trying to prey on vulnerable Australians, unfortunately. 
Now, you might prefer cash, Sophie, but the banks don't make that easy either. So many of them are now cashless. Look, let's move on to a story that you revealed in The Australian last week. Friends of Lisa Wilkinson say the TV host once back on the screen delivering blockbuster interviews, but some media executives aren't so keen. I should say former TV host, of course. She is still receiving her pay from 10 uh, while this whole trial uh, goes on in the background. Can you tell us more about this story? Oh, absolutely, Caroline. Look, everyone in Australia is familiar with Lisa Wilkinson. She's one of the biggest TV stars in the country. Uh, but her career had hit a serious roadblock when she gave that uh, speech at the Logies regarding the Brittany Higgins situation with Bruce Lerman. She basically has barely been on air at all over the past 18 months. And then she came out the end of last year, said she was the victim of basically media bullying and she'd be off the screens. Well, she hasn't been on air for 13 months, Caroline. Now, I spoke to a whole range of people in the industry, some on the record, some off the record. Uh, her very close friend, Peter Meekin, who is a high-profile executive uh, in the TV industry, said that he knows she wants to come back. But many executives, some who have worked with her, others who know her quite well, said the damage is done. She's done immense damage with the cause that she's uh, led with the Brittany Higgins story that's now the subject of a defamation trial. So we're all waiting to obviously see the outcome of the Bruce Lerman defamation trial to see what happens, which way the judge falls on that decision and whether Lisa will come back. But there's a lot of people saying it's going to be a very tough challenge for her to win back the Australian public. She became very partisan, Caroline. She became very anti-coalition, pro-Labor, very obviously she turned a lot of viewers off and uh, I think she's done herself quite a lot of harm so she is going to be trying to come back from what I've heard and what I have learned uh, doing this story. Well it's interesting you raise all these points Sophie I've been covering that defamation trial extensively and I mean while we can't offer much commentary the judge has reserved his decision on it he was quite clearly critical of Lisa Wilkinson over the wisdom of that Logie speech he even called her credibility into account uh, when the closing arguments were being heard last week saying she couldn't possibly have received legal advice at least it seemed unreasonable to him to go ahead with that speech but let's move on to something else Prince Harry is burning bridges what else is new, speaking of bullying by the media. Dominic West, the actor who plays King Charles in the Netflix hit series The Crown, has revealed that he and Harry are no longer acquaintances for a very ironic reason. Have a look. We still have his number there, surely? Uh, no, we sort of... Um, no. It, <laughs> I, I said too much in a press conference and, and so uh, we didn't speak after that. What did you say? I think I was asked what we Don't did. Don't say it again. What we, did, what, <laughs> what we did to celebrate when we got there and, and probably said something too much. Shouldn't promote a series on another uh, network, but it is a brilliant one. I've just finished the latest season. But for someone who has made a mozza out of airing the royal family's dirty laundry across the globe, Harry obviously doesn't like it when the shoe's on the other foot, does he? Oh, Caroline, I agree. Great series. Uh, but, yes, isn't this ironic? So Harry went on a big trek with Dominic West back in 2014. And uh, after this big trek they went on, uh, Dominic West has been reported as saying that they went on a bender and they were drinking alcohol out of one of their uh, fellow, you know, travellers with them out of his prosthetic leg. And Harry didn't like it when Dominic revealed this in the media, Caroline. So isn't this ironic that the man who demands privacy doesn't like it when people reveal things about him? The very thing that he has done to his own brother, his own father, his entire family has trashed them in the media. He doesn't like it when the shoe is on the other foot, as you said. So uh, what comes around goes around. So a uh, little sympathy from me for him, uh, Caroline, I must say. Well, that, those allegations about drinking out of a prosthetic leg, I have to say they just bring back memories of the whole Ben Roberts Smith defamation trial and those allegations involving him drinking out of a prosthetic leg. But we won't go there because we've already discovered enough legal trials. I mean, just on this Netflix series, I found it really curious, um, you know, that... 
Harry has a deal with Netflix. You know, he did a deal. They, they've filmed his... They platformed his documentary that he did with Megan. But he seems to have an issue, I think, perhaps, with Dominic West starring in this, this series about his family that was maybe not mm -hmm. authorised by him. Well, that's right. He's not happy with Dominic after he spoke about their trip, you know, many years ago. There's been dispute Dominic was too good looking to be playing uh, King Charles. So that's another <laughs> issue in itself. But uh, look, I thought it was a, a great series. Uh, you know, a lot of people, it's very popular, obviously. But look, Harry's got to get over himself. This guy's got grievances with so many people, Caroline. It's not the end of it, I hate to say. Sophie Ellsworth, thank you. It's always fun to speak to you. Okay, after the break, Australians are still splashing the cash despite the cost of living crisis. We'll get the latest data from the Boxing Day sales with a retail expert next. Welcome back to the program. Well, we know Australians are feeling the pinch when it comes to cost of living, but that has not slowed down spending this festive season. Boxing Day sales have seen thousands hit shopping precincts across the country as people try to snap up an end-of-year bargain. Joining me to discuss the latest data is Fleur Brown, Chief Industry Affairs Officer at the Australian Retailers Association. Fleur, sales galore at the moment. Do we know roughly how much was spent yesterday? Well, the forecast for yesterday's sales event were $1.25 billion for that one day. Uh, and then we're looking at a $23.9 billion spend in the period to the 15th of January, which is known as the post-Christmas sales period, uh, which is just slightly up on last year. How does this compare to Black Friday sales in November? Well, Black Friday sales are traditionally used for pre-Christmas purchasing, uh, so that's a big driver, uh, whereas Boxing Day sales are all about the clearances, a lot of people shopping for themselves and for their household, a bit of a different function. Uh, we have seen some of the Christmas spending brought forward as people look to get a bargain this year, definitely feeling that pressure on their household budgets and trying to reduce the overall cost of their, uh, their shopping. Uh, and with Boxing Day, we know many Australians have saved up uh, purchases for that period to try and get some of the necessary household items off their shopping list. How does it compare to last year? How much of an increase are we seeing? Yes, we're looking at just over a percent uh, of increase year on year, so we would call that quite modest. It's still a really good result in a cost of living crisis, so I think retailers can take some confidence from this as they head into the new year. Uh, however, there are, of course, many uh, nuances within those numbers, so the cost of doing business has increased enormously for many retailers, and that's factored into you know, that increased spend as well. How important are Boxing Day sales for retailers as we head into the new year? Boxing Day sales give a sense of momentum as they head into the January period. Uh, Christmas trading is absolutely critical. Many discretionary retailers make up to, to two-thirds of their profits during that time. Boxing Day is also essential uh, as a clearance event just to clear out that old stock and make way for the new and to give that confidence boost as they head into the new year with a, you know, with a new offering. What are shoppers usually going for when heating up the sales this week? Well, there's a really diverse range of clearance items on sale. You can get things in every category, of course. Uh, almost every category has stock left. And uh, particularly for fashion and clothing items, it's really important for retailers to clear out that stock to make way for the new, uh, the new look, the new trends, the new clothing and uh, accessory items for the new year. And so that's, that's a really big factor in many of the shopping exercises amongst Australians for the Boxing Day and uh, ongoing sales period through to mid-January. Flo Brown, thank you. And thank you for your company tonight. The Bolt Report is up next with Gary Hargrave. You'll see me again right here tomorrow night at six.